we still have people coming in still even the numbers are going up slightly so mm -hmm. anyway i will get started so hello everybody welcome um good afternoon good evening good morning depending on which time zone you are currently in i'm lorraine finch i am the chair of the institute of conservation environmental sustainability network i'm really pleased that this is the inaugural collaboration between the AIC and the Institute of Conservation. And I will let Roxy and Kate from the AIC introduce themselves. So over to you, you both. So that's Roxy and Kate. Ooh, my computer decided to make a noise. Hi, everyone. I'm Roxy. I'm so happy to be joining you, Lorraine, and everyone else for this awesome event uh, to coincide with COP26. I am the chair of the AIC Sustainability Committee this year. Um, I'm a paintings conservator um, and I'm very interested to hear more about sustainable practices and always to promote them and to talk about them. Uh, and I'm joined by our network officer, Kate, uh, who will introduce herself. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Kate Puget, um, and I'm also very excited about this event. As Roxy said, I'm the network officer, so um, please reach out to me um, or to our AIC Sustainability Gmail if you um, have any interest in collaboration or just want to chat about sustainability issues in the climate crisis. And I um, want to thank our three panelists today and Lorraine for um, organizing this with us and dedicating our time to um, share their knowledge and I'm really looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say today. So that's all us. So our plans for today are that we're going to have uh, five to ten minutes with each one of the panelists explaining what they've done in their work to adapt to their practices to sustainability. I'm going to do a brief introduction to each uh, panelists before they they do their five to ten minutes and then we're going to open the floor to a panel discussion so then it's over to you we don't have to stick with this structure it's all very nice and flexible and open it's about you getting what you need out of this session um like i said this afternoon morning or evening so without further ado i would go to pass over to elena actually to give you some brief housekeeping everybody, I'm Elena Gregg with AIC and FAIC. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Closed captioning is available today. So if you click on the CC link in your toolbar, you'll be able to access um, closed captioning. We're recording this session and it will be available to view later today. Um, and finally, if you have any questions for the panelists, uh, please enter them into the Q&A box. That's all for me. Thank you, Elena. So Roxy and Kate are going to be fielding the questions and passing them on to the panelists. So please do, uh, put, as, as Elena said, put your questions in the Q&A. We'll also be keeping an eye on the chat as well. And I can see everybody introducing themselves in the chat. Hi, Ellie. She's one of the ESN team. So hi to you all. So we're going to start with Ilva and I'll give you a, a brief introduction to Ilva. And then Ilva will do a presentation on how she's adapting her work. So Ilva is an accredited conservator who works as an independent consultant in sustainability for art and material culture. She specializes in historic places, collections in context and lived in heritage in the UK and Europe. She was previously head of collections conservation services at the National Trust for Scotland and consultant conservator for the National Trust in London and the southeast of England. And she designed and headed up the book and paper conservation studio at Dundee University. Ilva has served on many boards in the arts and cultural sector and is a founder member and trustee of the Institute of Conservation. And before that, she was chair of the Scottish Society for Conservation and Restoration and president of the European Confederation of Conservative Restorers Organisations. Passionate about nurturing emerging cons conservation professionals, Ilva is an assessor and mentor on the ICON accreditation scheme and was an external examiner for the MA in Conservation at the University of Arts London. And she currently teaches at the Conservation of Fine Art in Northumbria University. I'm sure there's a lot more that Ilva could have added to that. She, she said this is a very brief introduction. Ilva is Swedish born and she grew up green, tutored every summer by her grandfather, who was a forester and gamekeeper and who taught her that the forest is the finest thing there is, which it truly is. So over to you, Ilva. Thank you so much, Lorraine. I'm sorry that was uh, a bit long. Um, 
but I wanted to tell you how I got to the sort of work that I'm doing um, today from being um, a, a book and paper conservator um, in my training. Um, and you've done, you've touched on the places where I've worked. Um, I, I, as you said, I grew up green and I worried about acid rain and everyday chemicals and nuclear power, of course, and uh, the rubbish that was in sweets and all those things, because that was, I suppose we got that from school um, in Sweden. Um, and I came over at the age of nine and my teachers called me a flower child and couldn't understand why I was always going on about pollution and, and so on. Um, and I, when I became a conservator, um, I immediately bought into this very cozy bubble of the, the conservator and their, their object being somehow distant from the world that we were working in and all these um, environmental concerns. I mean, this is quite a long time ago now um, and um, didn't really question that. And it wasn't until a natural history conservator, a Scottish one called Joe Sage, in the 1990s, who actually berated us all at a conference for um, not um, being concerned about anything other than what we saw down the microscope or in the display case and how we overspecified um, our, our work and our display environments and, uh, and overpackaged everything while we were uh, in the same process, merrily polluting our, um, our world. So that was a bit of a wake up call, but I don't think that the profession really um, started moving on this until maybe a decade and a half um, after that, when the, uh, at least in the UK, when the National Museum Directors Council um, did, I suppose, what had been talked about for in other, in other um, for a, for a while, but they uh, agreed that we could actually widen the um, parameters for the acceptable environment for the display and storage of um, of art and, and artifacts. And it was um, it was a watershed moment, really. Um, and though I was working for the National Trust then, that officially had no demarcation between the conservation of the natural and the, and the made world, I still found that there was a disconnect between my work, which was inside the houses uh, and caring for collections and the exhibition spaces, and then those who cared for um, other parts of the historic interiors, which were still um, significant and some had original schemes and so on, uh, but they would be the, the shop and the tea room and the, you know, the loos uh, and other public spaces that were within uh, National Trust properties. So when I became uh, an independent conservator, I started to look for ways of joining these two uh, spheres of, of activity up. Um, and I started to do uh, to help my clients to do green rethinks of, of the whole of their, um, their, their collections and their lives, because uh, a lot of them actually live within, um, you know, a, a, a country house or, you know, a stake home or so on. Um, and um, so I, I started doing that just before the, the COVID um, lockdown. And then I wanted to show you something really disgusting, um, which I'll bring up on a slide of um, next, because in, in 2020, um, I had just come back from working in France and I found myself um, actually in the first UK lockdown, living in a, um, uh, in a narrow boat, a, a, a canal boat, uh, in an urban environment in, in, um, in Edinburgh, which is absolutely lovely, but it was very compact. And um, as you probably remember, the first lockdown went on for months and months, uh, and we were encouraged to go out and get exercise for about 20 minutes a day. And um, if you live on a, uh, you know, on a canal, then you've got the towpath and that's just about it. So I would so cycle along the towpath and uh, if I share the screen, hopefully. Uh, 
Can you see my screen? Now we can, yep. I can. Now you can, okay. Right, for some reason I can't now reach the play button. So I'll just do it. Um, can you see it over the whole screen? Oh, there we go. Fantastic, thank you, whoever did that. So that's how you can reach me should you want to uh, do that at some point. Um, so so um, during this lockdown, I started to bring together my, my passion for the environment and actually my professional practice. And I aligned myself to, um, to Greenpeace, to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, to Fashion Revolution, and all those ones who, who were really, really um, putting a lot of material online and a lot of uh, courses and so on. And I learned a new uh, set of vocabulary, which I'm sure you will all know by now. And I wanted to just explain to you, <laughs> I, I wanted to illustrate um, the concepts of anthropocent, I can't even say, anthropocentrism, prism, uh, and cosmoperceptions, which I heard in a very good presentation uh, a couple of days ago from COP26. So I was cycling along the uh, towpaths, and this is when we suddenly decided that the world was very, very precious, and that maybe we were very vulnerable as a, as a human race, um, and that maybe uh, the anthropocentrism was not <laughs> the, the right um, outlook. And this is, um, you know, five minute cycle ride from where we were moored. Um, and it was a very beautiful place. And I used to sit there and listen to the birds and the look at the tadpoles. And then one day when I was sitting on a jetty, I found this. And um, for me, this is just the visual epitome of everything that is wrong with us as humans and our lives and um, the public spaces that we inhabit. So if you look, this is, a, this is a little jetty here. Can you see my pointer? Um, and on the top right, there is um, a close up of, of what I saw. So in one cubic centimeter, um, I think we're illustrating there um, a lot of um, a lot of what we have to change. So somebody has uh, squashed together a chewing gum, a cigarette butt, and uh, the ring pull from a can of carbonated drink of some kind or a beer or whatever. Um, so there you have it. Um, these are things we put in our mouths. They have no nutritional value um, between them, and they actually cause us harm as an organism. We're the only, um, we're the only species um, that I know of that poisons its own food. Um, and it's been left in this space that we share with um, um, all the other parts of, of biodiversity and, um, and its pollution and, and everything. So for, that, for me, that was a bit of a, a wake up call really. And my, I decided to extend my focus to sharing my, my private and professional um, passions for sustainability and for nature more widely than I was doing with my clients. Um, and that was the end of the slide, okay, fine. Um, so I've started to do more public um, teaching, workshops where uh, people can come and learn skills that are useful for their, uh, for their lives, to understand um, as a conservator, I feel that I'm in a right, in a very good place to help people look beyond the surface of things and to understand more fully um, and more instinctively the stuff that the world is made out of. So whether that is um, the difference between uh, different natural and man-made fibers in textiles um, and how to choose your clothing, how to look after it, what questions to ask uh, the manufacturers, um, how to... Um, refuse, you know, um, reuse, repurpose, recycle, upcycle, whatever. And I, I must say, uh, Fashion Revolution, if you haven't found their website yet, is absolutely brilliant on all kinds of levels uh, for that. And, um, and on the circular economy. Um, and Ellen MacArthur Foundation has just given out a, um, or reissued 
uh, an extremely good report on the circular economy, which um, I suppose fills in the, the parts that are missing from the, um, at least the public conversation that's coming out of COP26 at the moment. It's only half the story and actually closing up the circle is what we need to do. So um, to, to finish off with, I think that I want to um, just share the, the, um, the successes that I've had with that sort of activity. Um, it's, it's very rewarding. And as conservators, I think that we are in a really good position to explain uh, what happens when you recycle materials, uh, why it's, it's not the answer to uh, most things. <laughs> um, and also to, uh, we're good at explaining why things work in a, in a simple way. We've got fantastic material that, um, you know, from our everyday work to show the ingenu ingenuity of um, humans through the ages, and especially during times of uh, scarcity of, of resources and whatever, like, uh, you know, for, for, for Britain, that would have been the, the the two world wars, but I mean, there, there are all kinds of uh, challenges that um, that people have overcome by making fantastic use of what there is. Um, we are in a fantastic position to uh, debunk all the green, greenwashing that uh, we're subjected to uh, on a daily basis now that most companies understand that they, you know, they can't uh, not have a, a sustainability policy or, a, you know, talk about ethical sourcing or whatever it is that they, they need to illuminate. And yet there is a, such a lot of rubbish um, being said out there. And we're, I think, um, um, as a professional group, we can, we can share our knowledge and upskill people to, to um, see through that and to make their own decisions. Um, we can share things like uh, skills for mending to, to build resilience and wellness. Um, and our sector, uh, somebody pointed out in another presentation a couple of days ago, you know, in, in a world of fake news and, and smoke and mirrors, our sector is still trusted and therefore uh, we are in a good position to, um, I suppose, reiterate basic truths. So um, I would encourage everybody to, uh, to make more noise really uh, as conservators and make sure that we're part of the conversations, not just within our um, sector, but, but with um, allied sectors and, and those which are uh, far away too. Uh, the, the artist and demigod Grace and Perry called conservation that weirdly mystical science. And I'll finish off by saying that we, we really should um, allow ourselves to exploit the fact more that we are the happy marriage between art and science. So I, um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilva. That was really interesting. Um, and, you know, I really agree with you about how we should be making more noise, um, both within our institutions, within the sector and in the wide world as well. So next we have Nicola. Now, Nicola is a chartered mechanical engineer with experience in aerospace, energy and education. In 2018, she was appointed to the newly created Chips Conservation Engineer post at Brunel's SS Great Britain in Bristol. And she is responsible for energy optimization of the system, conserving the world's first iron ship by creating a microclimate around the original material to prevent corrosion. So in this role, she is also working with colleagues across both the organization and across the city to develop the Trust's Climate Action Plan. So I'll pass it over to Nicola to explain more. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. Um, so. Uh, as, as per the introduction you just had, I am um, not a conservator, um, I'm a mechanical engineer, although I have to say, um, when I've been at various conservation um, events and conferences and things, I've been really refreshed by how many people will say, oh, I'm not a conservator either. Um, 
one of the things I really in, I've really enjoyed about my kind of recent career move into conservation is how um, how much um, kind of cross disciplinary collaboration there is, and I think that's a real strength. Um, and I'll touch a little bit later on um, why I think that's so important. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I'm a mechanical engineer. I uh, have a, had a fairly traditional education. I've got an engineering degree um, and I work for an engineering consultancy. Um, my specialism is um, kind of heat and energy. So it's about kind of how air and heat move around spaces um, and the how that kind of lends itself to the SS Great Britain. Um, I, I started off um, doing various calculations, heat related calculations for um, energy systems and um, I've also done some air related calculations for aerospace so i um, got a good bit of experience um, doing that sort of stuff in real life and then I am um, prior to moving to the SS Great Britain I also took a, a short career break during which I um, worked teaching secondary school children um, computer coding um, so it's that kind of combination of the technical experience and also the communication experience um, which led me towards the job at the SS Great Britain. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick screen share. Um, so for anybody who, um, for anybody who um, hasn't visited the SS Great Britain, this is what she looks like from above. Um, she was the, the world's first iron ship. She was designed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who Bristol have got a bit of a soft spot for um, as an engineer. Um, and that basically what makes the ship so special is the, the fact that she was made from iron allowed her to be bigger and um, achieve more than any ship possibly ha had ever done in the past and also to last longer. Um, so she was launched in 1843 um, and salvaged in 1970, having had an almost 100 year long uh, kind of productive, profitable working life. Um, but and then was um, scuttled and abandoned uh, for a, a few decades before being salvaged and brought back to Bristol. Yeah. I don't have a before photo. Sorry, that would have been quite a good thing to have. Um, so the the um, this angle here shows um, basically shows that you've got um, kind of a fake waterline. So what what we've got with the ship, um, her original material is is degrading because uh, it's very early wrought iron. Um, it's also the um, it's also soaked with salt. Um, but in particular, the part below the waterline is particularly soaked with salt because that's the part which would have been sat in the salt water. Um, the part above the waterline uh, would have been uh, washed by the rain, etc. So it's a bit cleaner. Um, so this is what the ship looks like from above. Um, and if I just move the slide on, this is what she looks like from below. Um, and pretty much the the kind of primary trick that uh, we use to conserve the ship is to create and you can probably just about visualize it from this picture to create an invisible curtain of air, um, which uh, so you can kind of see the nozzles coming up from underneath the ship. Um, we've got air at, um, we've got very dry air coming out of those nozzles. Um, and the idea is that, that that air flows along the surface of the ship um, and then it disappears into the kind of metallic snake things that you can see um, coming around the side of the ship. Um, and by doing that, what we're trying to do um, is we're trying to um, to get the 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 kind of bit of air that's right next to the ship uh, to twenty percent relative humidity, which is is very dry, especially if you if you live in the UK, it's very dry indeed. Um, and we're trying we're trying to get the um, so if you can imagine the cur what the curtain of air would look like over the surface of the ship, we're trying to get that air at twenty percent relative humidity um, while also allowing people into the dry dock with it. So um, the, the, the part of the space where the people are is not at 20% relative humidity, because what we've tried to do is to engineer that curtain of air so that it, it just flows along the surface of the ship. So um, the uh, that uh, solution was uh, designed by a team of uh, engineers of various different disciplines. So you've got uh, mechanical engineers, you've got your um, fluid dynamics specialists, you've got your electronics and your control engineers, you've got your software engineers. Um, and uh, you've got your uh, structural engineers and civil engineers who did the work on the dry dock um, and all of those engineers being managed by a curator um, who, who kind of led the creation of this project. Um, and once this project was finished, so that was about 2005, um, the, fr from then until my role was created, which is 15 years later, um, the, the system was maintained 
by separate engineers maintaining the separate parts, but there wasn't really anybody um, who kind of had ownership uh, for the system as a whole. So my job was newly, cre newly created um, to, to try and take that on. So um, all of the individual parts were working fine, um, but it was how they were talking to each other and how the system as a whole was working, um, which was what my job was created to address. Um, so the, I guess my, my job description is that I am responsible for conservation strategy for the ship. Um, day to day, that involves um, kind of con controls, mechanics, how things talk to each other, um, what's going on with the air, that sort of thing. Um, but um, one of the uh, kind of one of the key things that the um, exec team had in mind um, when my job was created was, of course, sustainability. Now, the uh, the mission statement for the SS Great Britain Trust is to conserve the ship in her dry dock for all time and for the benefit. Of all. Um, so there's a sustainability and an inclusivity um, literally written into the mission statement of the trust, which um, I'll, I'll come back to a bit later, but that's something I like to remind people of when it comes to inf trying to influence people and, and to get, get action when you need it. Um, so part of my job was to, to look at the sustainability of the system. Um, it, as you can probably imagine, it uses quite a lot of energy. So um, unlike a lot of um, organizations in our sector, um, our what I call our scope well what is called um that our scope one and scope two carbon footprint is quite a lot bigger than our scope three carbon footprint um which I don't think is all that common but um if museums have got big uh, close controlled spaces then um scope one and scope two um are do you, do you want me to describe what I mean by scope one and scope two so basically um scope one is the uh, the co2 that we as an organization directly put into the atmosphere um, so in practical terms, for most organisations, that's any gas that they burn, any fossil fuels that they burn themselves. Um, and uh, so that's things like gas boilers, gas heaters, um, and also um, company cars, basically, are, the, are pretty much the, um, the main sources of scope one. Um, so scope two are fossil fuels that are put in the atmosphere by other people in the process of generating our electricity. Um, so unless your electricity is 100% renewable, then that's your scope two. Um, and scope three is basically everything else. So all of the CO2 that is put into, into the atmosphere um, for your entire supply chain and your customers while interacting with you. Um, so scope three can be quite daunting, but um, again, I'm, I'm sure that this is something that we'll come back to late, later in the discussion and um, I can share a few insights about how to, how to kind of get your head around scope three later on. Um, anyway, come, to come back to the point, um, so we've actually got a fairly appreciable scope one and scope two, so therefore it, it is worthwhile spending some time on um, really making sure that the system uses as little energy as it possibly can. Um, in 2019, we declared a climate emergency um, and the Trust have committed to become carbon neutral by 2030. Um, I'm not entirely sure how we're going to do that, but um, we're kind of learning as we go along. And we have we have actually made some big improvements already. Um, one of the first things that I, one of the first kind of big meaningful things that I did um, as part of this job was to upgrade the uh, the sensors and the software that controls this system, which then gives us access to a lot more information and a lot more data, um, which we can then start to use to kind of analyze when does it work well, when does it not work well, um, what what bits use the most energy, um, and, and then, you know, we can use that information to start making changes. Um, we've also... Um, recently had um, a couple of uh, made a couple of kind of hardware upgrades so made physical improvements to the uh, kit which conditions the air um, so on the theme of collaboration we we recently had a collaboration with one of our suppliers where basically we help them with their publicity because as you can imagine um, you know we're, we're quite a, a big and very visually appealing project we help them with some publicity in exchange for a discount on some of that um, and then we've also been applying for so a, another part of my job of course is to write the business cases to write the funding applications um, to um, to make the changes that we need to reduce our carbon footprint um, so aside from the energy side of stuff, um, I'm also kind of kind of working um, with a group, a working group we've got from across the whole organisation um, to help just make sure that we're all talking to each other about climate related things and, and 
what we can do and sharing ideas and things. Um, and I'm also currently in the process of uh, writing or drafting at least our organization's climate action plan, which is hopefully going to capture all of this work and uh, it will be a living document which um, over the next few years will hopefully start to turn into a bit of a roadmap as to how we are actually going to become carbon neutral. Um, I guess that my final point is, I will just make one more point before I finish for now, um, and I, I guess that's that um, I did allude to it a little bit before, it's about the, the engineering and communication thing. Um, a, a lot of what I find myself doing is translating uh, between um, engineering contractors and um, our curatorial team or our directors, etc. Et um, and I, um, I made a comment in, um, there was an event earlier in the year about um, passive, sustainable passive um, climate control. And I made a comment at, at that event and, uh, about how um, it's uh, definitely a, a problem that a lot of people I've spoken to have with engineers is finding them incomprehensible, finding them very difficult to understand. Um, and in, in my opinion, engineers are terrible at communicating with non-engineers. Um, and that's something, especially with things like jargon. And I know jargon is gonna be one of the themes that we talk about this evening. Um, so yeah, the, I've, I found myself becoming a bit of a, an organizational jargon buster and um, just generally becoming a translator between the, the kind of technical and the non-technical side of the organization. Um, and yeah, I think that's, I think that one of the really key things that we need to do if we're going to improve um, is to improve the way that we communicate because um, I think it's really important to be working cross-disciplinary. I think it's really important to avoid duplicating effort um, because you know this is an emergency. This is there's not time to to be doing the same thing that somebody else did five years ago. And I think it's communication that that is the key to unlocking that. Thank you, Nicola. And so that's the second time tonight that communication has been flagged as the important factor. And I completely agree with you on that. That you know it's it's what we need to be doing. As you say, it's an emergency. We shouldn't be duplicating effort. We should be sharing. Um, our work with one another, which is what tonight is about. So we'll, with no further delay, we will move on to Lois. So Lois is representing Catherine Ara Limited, mm -hmm. an independent easel paintings conservation and restoration studio based in West London, where she works as studio manager. Over the past year, Lois has directed the company's process of reviewing and adapting its practices to become more sustainable, an effort that recently saw Catherine Ara Limited be awarded a B Corp status, which is amazing. So over to you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so I think the first thing to do is to explain exactly what a B Corp is um, for those of you who may not be familiar. And I'll share my screen because they have um, a very, what I hope will be a recognizable logo. Um, that can be found sort of increasingly um, in your inboxes from companies you bought something from years ago, um, where lots of lots of companies are now considering it a very important um, sort of benchmark certification to attain. Um, and it's a way of avoiding, we were talking about greenwashing earlier, of avoiding that because it is quite a rigorous process um, in order to become certified um, and B Corp, um, the organisation, are very sort of stringent in making sure that people are not just talking the talk, but also walking the walk. Um, so in brief, a B Corp is a business that works to balance purpose and profit. So B Corps meet verified standards of social and environmental performance, um, and furthermore are legally bound to commit to sustainable practices. Uh, so the start of our B Corp journey was when Catherine, a uh, company owner and the director of the studio, um, decided to make a real effort to follow a new business model um, that would allow her to achieve a better balance of purpose and profit. Uh, so we decided to undertake to become a B Corp because the organisation requires businesses to complete a self-assessment online. Um, now, this assessment provides a really useful and really thorough framework um, within which a business can sort of situate um, its kind of improvements and its efforts um, in order to sort of adapt and change its business practices and system. 
Um, and it provided us with really useful hints as to what we should embed into our daily practices um, and how exactly to legally commit ourselves to consider the impact of um, all of our decisions um, through kind of certain legal pathways. Uh, for what I mean by that is basically we changed and adapted our articles of association um, and wrote an official mission statement, which the business didn't have before, um, and which I'll wager most conservation studios wouldn't think it would be necessary to have um, to really to sort of lock in our commitments to being sustainable. So we started very much from scratch um, and the process took about a year. Uh, I think it's fair to say that it entailed quite a steep learning curve for us all. Um, and right at the beginning, Catherine very rightly saw that we, we would need some help in understanding a lot of the terminology um, that goes with the territory of sustainability. Um, we were faced with words like metrics and KPIs, which turn out to be key performance indicators, um, and um, scope one, two and three emissions, um, which Nicola helpfully um, explained to us just now. Um, so we were very lucky to be put in touch with a brilliant guy called Leon, um, who was at the time a master's student in London in environmental sustainability. Um, and he acted as a sort of external consultant for us as we progressed through filling out the online assessment. Um, we would have sort of semi-regular meetings with him um, and were able to ask him questions and, and he would let us know if we were on the right track. Um, so the first step was to identify key data sets to collect and process, uh, which we based on the concerns of the, the B Corp framework, including things like energy use, water use, and waste generated and recycled. Um, so crucially, B Corp require this data to be collected over time. So we had to first come up with ways of collecting, recording, and analyzing this data. Um, which we decided to do very simply in, in basic spreadsheets. Um, and I'll pop an example of an empty spreadsheet on there for now, um, which I um, invite comments on and I'll come back to it later. This is just an example of something that we would have in our computer systems to fill out on a regular basis. Part of my role as studio manager is sort of weekly, monthly, depending on what it is we're measuring, just to record, um, for example, how, what our water meter says that week. Um, and then over time, we'll have data which shows if we're reducing the amount we're using, if the amount we're using was higher that month, and then we can diagnose why that might be and do something about it. So, while the focus of this panel is, of course, environmental sustainability, I think it is important to take a brief detour here, touching on something that um, Nicola was just saying about sustainability and inclusivity going hand in hand. Um, following the B Corp framework really made us realise that sustainability means more than operating in a greener way, and it's equally about operating in a socially responsible way. And in fact, the two strands, um, if you like, are inextricably bound up. Um, the B Corp self-assessment is structured around four key themes to en encapsulate this. It's governance, community, environment, and customers, which are all given equal weighting. So environment just being a quarter of, um, of what sustainability means um, from this holistic viewpoint. Um, one of the most rewarding changes we've made as a company actually is to our governance structure, um, where we've reworded our legal documents to count all of our regular workers, including employees and freelancers, as stakeholders. And this then means that everyone's entitled to have a say in the running of the business and in maintaining the studio's sustainability goals. And from doing this, it means we've had a chorus of voices to give feedback and input into any changes to company policies, um, that we've made during our, our push to operate more sustainably. Um, as a consequence, the, the project and the journey as it is really belongs to everyone um, and its success is everyone's legal responsibility. Um, so to return to the narrative of our B Corp journey, the next step is to identify areas where the studio was falling short of B Corp's requirements. Um, which was in most things to start with. <laughs> um, it did feel like a, a bit of a daunting task, but um, 
luckily there were small steps to make um, as we progress through the self-assessment, which is why it was such a useful framework. Um, so this is where sort of considering completing the assessment as a, a medium term project was useful. Um, it was never going to happen overnight. Um, and it did, as I said, it did require about a year in order to design and implement both new studio processes and to write up official documentation that would commit us to our sustainability goals. Um, while the majority of this work was done alongside every day of the studio, we were able to take advantage of my own time out of the studio um, working remotely during the first lockdown um, to really kind of get my teeth into doing the tasks. Um, and also we had a remote work experience student at the time, um, Chloe Chang, who was based in Canada um, when we were filling out our assessment. Um, and we were able to sort of delegate her with kind of more time consuming tasks, um, which I think she found very interesting, very rewarding. Um, so for example, Chloe looked at profiling all of our suppliers, researching alternative greener options that were more local to the studio, for example, or that used um, more sustainable manufacturing methods. Um, in my time, I composed the mission statement I was talking about, a code of ethics and a company policies document, um, all of which are publicly available on our company website, um, which I'll write in the chat box once I finish speaking, um, if anyone's interested to look at them. Um, and this is designed to hold, hold us accountable to our sustainability aims. Um, so eventually we were able to go through the B Corp assessment online, fill out our responses to arrive at a high enough score to be considered for verification. Um, and that process involved an interview and then for us to provide evidence in the form of all this data we've been collecting and the documentation we've been writing um, to show that we, we had been doing what we professed that we were doing. Uh, so to keep track of this goal, um, like one example of the thing that we measure uh, is our commitment to minimize shipping and business travel. So for this in a spreadsheet, much like this one I showed you earlier, um, we record journeys made by ourselves to a client's house, for example, um, or by shippers delivering works to and from the studio. Um, and then we work out the distances that they would have traveled and the carbon toll of these journeys. Um, we, for, to work that out, talking about not kind of reinventing the wheel and using resources that are available, uh, we use a company called Climate Care, um, where they have a, a sort of carbon calculator online where I type in what distance was traveled by what kind of vehicle using what fuel um, and they work out the um, the carbon toll of, of those journeys and then propose a cost to to offset um, that carbon toll. So I'll just move to a different slide so you can see the studio and who I'm talking about. Um, it's Catherine at the easel in the foreground there and my colleague Mia in the background. So as you can see, it's, it's a relatively small studio um, and has been a good, what I think a good um, sort of guinea pig in how spaces can be adapted to become more sustainable um, in, in conservation. So now that we've oriented the company policies and procedures, um, as well as the studio space itself, towards making positive social and environmental impacts, we're now focusing on implementing changes to the actual processes of conservation and restoration, um, which actually proved to be kind of too long term and um, I think that's a bit too challenging actually to sort of include in our initial B Corp verification. Um, we just we didn't have tools um, to hand that we were using to collect the data um, and similarly to, to know which changes to make. Um, and it wasn't there was nothing that seemed to be readily available or very easy to incorporate into our practice um, in order to, to sort of make meaningful change in this way. Um, so it'd be a wonderful thing to. I know, I know we'll talk about that um, later on. That's, I'm, I'm very keen for any questions or any comments that anyone might have in that regard. Um, 
So there is fantastic research and resources and that have been made in recent years by various organisations. Um, in particular, we're in the process of designing a system to record the carbon intensity of individual conservation projects um, by using the um, AIC online carbon calculator. Um, and that is where what this spreadsheet has been designed for. Um, we'll have, can you see my cursor by any chance? Great. So we'll have sort of the project there. Um, name is going to be for the conservator, the treatment um, that's kind of been carried out on the painting. Material is for which um, sort of conservation materials will be used, cotton buds, um, any solvents, for example, the amount of this material used, and then the carbon intensity of having used the material, uh, which is something that the carbon calculator will be able to help us with, um, which is something that actually we discovered after um, we'd gone through the process of our B Corp assessment. And um, had we sort of found it earlier, we might have been able to incorporate that into our scope one emissions, um, which just to remind you are the emissions that a company makes itself um, into that calculation, but we didn't know. So it will be something for next time. So just to conclude then, uh, what I hope to have conveyed is that while committing to a sustainable practice may seem daunting, it can absolutely be achieved um, just by taking it gradually and in small steps, making changes incrementally and building up new ways of going about daily operations and cultivating new habits like collecting data. Um, another take home point is that data really is key. Uh, you can't do anything without it. Um, but luckily, it's something that's very easy to do and anyone can start doing it straight away and for free, which is very important, I know. Um, so we have been able to reach standards high enough to be counted as a B Corp without outsourcing much work to third parties um, or really disrupting the work of our studio. Uh, we're all quite surprised, to be honest, but it just shows that over the course of, of the year, the incremental changes that gradually built up as we developed new habits made a huge difference. It's just taken patience and commitment from the whole team um, to implement lasting changes. Um, that sometimes means a bit more admin to complete, um, but is well worth it. Thank you, Lois. That was absolutely fascinating. And it's clearly a very thorough process to become a B Corp and uh, achievement that you should be justifiably proud of. So let's move on to the questions and I hand over now to Roxy and Kate. I can see there's one question in the Q&A, but please fire off your questions for our panellists. Yes, fire away. We have some questions ourselves and I'm sure all of you do as well. So please do include those. Um, I will start off with the question that's already in the chat. Um, this is for Nicola. Have you changed to a renewable electricity supplier? And I think this actually could apply to, to um, a lot of you who are here, to all of our panelists, but that was a question I had uh, repeatedly. Um, and also this should dramatically reduce your scope two emissions or are you uh, generating dry air on site with fossil fuels? Um, so this is not an easy answer. Um, so yes. Basically, if you uh, one of the ways that you can completely eliminate your uh, scope two emissions is to move to a um, an energy supply supplier that uses completely renewables. Um, the the carbon footprint per unit of electricity um, obviously varies depending on the um, method used to generate it. But when you're choosing an energy energy supply, you need to look at um, where they're getting their energy from. I'm not sure how it works anywhere else in the world, but uh, in the UK, um, energy people who generate energy sell it into the grid, um, and then people who supply energy to customers buy it from the grid. Um, so you're, if you are buying a green energy supply, you are not having electricity coming directly from a wind turbine to your site. Um, you are having electricity coming still from the same grid that all of the other electricity comes from. Um, so the um, different organisations have got different ways of um, kind of squaring that off to make it to make it green. Um, so you've got some organisations who um, so the one the, the companies that are both energy generators and energy suppliers um, will say that they um, 
they will generate green a unit of green electricity for every unit of electricity they supply you. Um, and then you've got other other um, suppliers. So you have some suppliers who um, sell green electricity, but they don't actually generate any electricity. Um, and there are various different uh, kind of methods they use to do that. And whether that includes mm -hmm. offsetting, whether that includes um, energy credits, etc. cetera. Um, so you have to dig a little bit deeper to, to work out kind of how green really is your energy supply. And there are some kind of best, best practice guidelines about that. Um, but the, the reason it's unfortunately more complicated for us is that we, um, firstly, uh, one of the reasons that most homes in the UK have got uh, gas boilers uh, is that providing heat with gas is much, much cheaper than providing heat with electricity. So as things currently stand, um, gas is the only economically viable way um, for us to um, generate the heat that our dehumidifiers need. Um, so that obviously is a situation that we need to move away from. So one of the reasons that we're working so hard on um, like data and control algorithms and all that sort of stuff is that when we reach the point where we, where it becomes well, I'm hoping that at some point in the next decade, it's going to become economically viable for us to move away from gas. That's a, that's a political question rather than a technical question. Um, but when that day comes, we need to make sure that we've got the best possible understanding um, of how the system works so that we can make sure that um, moving from gas to electricity is, is not going to cause us any technical issues. Um, so there's a, there's a technical thing there. Um, and then there's also a kind of a bigger picture organizational thing and um, we actually buy our electricity um as part of a um like a, a buying club um which is where we get together with lots of other organizations and because there's lots of us together that then makes us a big enough customer to negotiate deals um so um that's got pros and cons so the the con firstly we're we're currently tied into a, a deal until 2023 um so we're not in a position to change our supplier at the moment um however um sh when when we get to the stage where um where it's time for us to change our supplier i th i think as if i if i've understood correctly we are one of the kind of bigger uh, members of that group in terms of our buying in terms of our consumption so in theory, that should mean that we've got some influence when the when the time comes to to renew our deal. So, um, so my job is to make sure that the uh, person on our board who is responsible for interfacing with that group is well briefed on hmm. what to be looking for when that time comes, um, and that you know we can use our influence to to try and make sure that we that we get the right the right deal when that time comes. So the short answer is uh, no, we're not at the moment, but the long answer is that we're working very hard on it. That's great. Super interesting. Kate? Hi. Um, so I have, we have another question from the chat and this is for Lois. Um, and the question in, is, is it possible to share the work of uh, Chloe Lucas in order to know more sustainable options? Just that. Oh yeah, Chloe Chang. So what I oh, would, okay. yeah, what I would suggest you do, I put our studio email address um, in the chat, um, which is studio at katherineara.com. So it's Catherine, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E-A-R-A.com. Um, because I think it's quite, um, I mean, the, it was a lot of, a lot of work for her um, going through kind of all different kind of suppliers, um, looking at everything. And I think it is, specific to kind of where you are um what exactly you need for example there are certain things that we just haven't been able to replace at the moment for example isinglass is a bit of a nightmare from a sustainability point of view um but that's something that we're we need to kind of is a, a bigger project experimenting with alternatives um and kind of i suppose waiting for something that that is a a good enough alternative to be manufactured, um, which will come from demand from people asking for it, I suppose. So um, I think I'm very happy to answer kind of specific questions about um, sustainable alternatives, um, but it might be um, better to send us an email. And of course, um, we'll share share with you kind of if we've found anything good um, for sort of what you're thinking of specifically. 
you. I know a lot of people would find that very helpful. So that's wonderful. All right. Um, I don't see any more from the audience. So I'm going to ask perhaps one um, of Ilva. Um, I'm just curious, I loved what you said about um, sort of leaning into our strengths as a conservation community and looking at sort of what we can do and, and where we sit in that. Um, I'm curious sort of what you would suggest the first steps for somebody who wants to embrace that way of thinking and that sort of um, integrating, you know, private practice or integrating just your personal work with um, the sustainable mindset. I'm sort of interested in, you know, where you started with that in that, on that journey and how you sort of went about it. Um, I just did it. Um, <laughs> that's what everyone should do. Um, you have to, um, as you say, you, you have to lean out really and uh, get yourself into the, the conversations. For instance, if we're talking about textiles, um, the, the clothing company Toast uh, is running a, um, a an online um, series on on makers, which also uh, encompasses textile textile artists and um, um, and people who do mending. Um, and so I, I I've I I um, I tuned into some of those conversations, and it really exasperated me that they're wasn't a, a conservation a textile conservation voice in there because they were it was it was extremely interesting and in all different viewpoints although it was a little bit um either the mending is invisible or it's japanese and covered in gold you know uh, and, and i think whether well, there are really um a lot of european techniques that people uh, maybe don't know so much about and it would be fascinating for textile conservators to just um share the the beauty of the old men's that they come across so uh going into the more aesthetic i suppose um and i was delighted to see that the uh independent textile conservator zenzi tinker uh who's based in brighton uh was eventually part of um an event that i think salvage magazine ran again with with um different people who who um, focused on mending so I, I think it's it's important to know what's happening where and to to just um uh to keep your ear to the ground and then to make sure that you um invite or, or you know ask ask for an invitation in in the places where where these discussions are being held mm. uh, for instance, I think um, if you're familiar with the uh, sustainability group Julie's Bicycle, um, who do lots of really, really uh, good work, some of it funded by the Arts Council England. Um, and I suppose I'm quite frustrated there that the whole of the museums and galleries um, sector is um, doesn't have the you know the conservation element in the discussion so i i think it, it's um it's just a matter of getting in there does that, does that answer it yeah no i think that's a really nice sort of way of thinking about it just thinking more broadly beyond the bench so to speak um mm. yeah thank you all right Keith, did you we want have to um a really great question from Deborah that um, I'm going to ask to everyone. And I know we're approaching 3pm. Um, so I understand if some people have to leave. Um, but I think this is just a really lovely question. Um, so what does the panel suggest might be big wins? Um, you know, given that we are in an emergency, time really is of the essence. Um, what would be big wins? And what would be easy wins? Um, you know, in other words, good places to start, you know, easy places to make an impact sooner, um, you know, and what things are going to be a little bit more challenging that maybe we don't want to start with, you know, for, for people um, who are listening, who are looking for a nice place to start um, to be more sustainable in their practice or collections care. Um, and Lois, if we could start with you. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm just thinking kind of the, the, easiest changes that we made were to 
the, our studio space itself. And actually a lot of them have ended up um, saving us money. So they don't go into kind of issues kind of about profitability um, or sort of rebudgeting. Um, so we changed all of our light bulbs to be LED, um, which cut our energy bills, energy consumption, a huge amount. I think um, the, the first step that I would suggest for everyone to, to do who's interested is to just start collecting really basic sets of data, energy use, water use, waste use over six months, three to six months, probably three months is absolutely fine, and find out kind of what you're using um, and then make a few easy changes. Um, we fitted a lime scale um, inhibitor, which has helped um, kind of regulate our kind of water supply to the studio. We changed to LED lights um, and we, by kind of weighing our waste every week, we're really conscious um, when we've just kind of been throwing too many things away um, or kind of buying things that are in too much packaging um, and it becomes very clear. Um, so I think just doing really kind of basic things that maybe won't interfere too much with kind of da daily practices um, is a really excellent way to start and just to kind of click into the mindset um, of kind of forming new habits and, and acting more sustainably. Thank you, Lois. That's really wonderful practical information, which I think I'm, I'm at least I'm always searching for. Um, Nicola, do you want to answer that same question? So what would be some easy places or um, places with a nice impact for people to start? Um, yeah, so I, I would, um, I would, I would second the light bulbs, actually, it's amazing how big a difference it makes. Um, but I think it depends, it depends on what kind of an organisation you are. And it, the answer to that question is going to be different for everyone. Um, so I can talk a bit about, about um, what, what we, what we've done and what we've had um, big successes from the, the kind of the move that we've made recently that I am most proud of is that we've taken all of our um, all of our um, investment, all of our endowment funding and all of our pensions now from fossil fuels. We don't have any any of our investment portfolio invested in, in fossil fuels. Um, it's a very easy one to not think about because it's not visible in your day to day life, um, but um, it's it was surprisingly easy to do like there are people out there who know who's investing in fossil fuels um who's not um the kind of ethics of the various um banks etc are are quite um reasonably well known and it's um uh, so yeah i was i was really pleased that our um board were supportive of that and and that's what our organization have done so that's actually probably the biggest thing that we've done aside from um, kind of well I'm hoping I'm hoping that our work to cut our own energy use will become a big thing but um, that's that's still in progress um, and in terms of the easiest um, again it's it's kind of the things that you do most often I think are the ones that you can make the most change with uh, with the small things I love I love again that practical advice so thank you Nicola and then finally, Ilva, what do you think is a, a good place for folks to start? Uh, well, it's great to go last because everybody said things that obviously was going to say first. But I think uh, also starting with ourselves, we talked about the professional practice and the you know the professional space. But um, why I think one needs to um, to reform every part of of our lives, and therefore. Uh, starting with maybe um, reducing the temperature in office spaces and office environments and actually wearing jumpers and um, not, um, you know, not pretending that things are the way they, they always were. Um, I've talked quite a bit about clothing and textiles because of fashion revolution being my passion and, and there are things there that you can you can do as well as all the the practical professional uh, practice things that have already been mentioned that you can still make part of that effort and that you can um, publicize even as part of that effort so um, 
I think that's my contribution. Obviously, um, reduce and reuse all the packaging you possibly can at work and, um, and share those resources, share, um, for instance, you know, for big decants uh, of collections that I've been involved in, making sure that the uh, all the specialist packaging and the shelving and whatever can be um, used by somebody else and, and just making sure that that resource is shared. I love that you because are. we really do need to do you know, everything both personally and professionally. So thank you, Ova. So I think we're out of time, but we do have one last question that I just thought I would read out as a reflection for everyone, including the panelists. Um, uh, so it says, regarding the urgency and very, very limited time in which climate action has to happen, how would you answer this question? Do the measures we are already taking and want to take really meet the urgency of the crisis? So I think certainly, um, that is something to all dwell on and think about as we're as we're watching the events unfold in uh, COP26. So thank you all for um, attending this event and for participating uh, and having so many questions that we ran out of time. <laughs> um, so yeah, we hope to do this again. This would be a really great collaboration to keep going. Uh, and you know, this is a global crisis, so having a global audience is really important. So. Um, Thank you all for your uh, attention.